Um, the next person I've had the pleasure to know extremely well. Um, okay, so about five years ago, is it five years ago? Five years ago, someone came to visit me and my wife, Sadia, and we had a nice, a nice like, I think it was like a, we had a kebab or something. And, and, and during that time, it was basically discussing, I want to make a denim factory in, Lon in London. And I was like, why? I didn't really understand the concept at that time. But I said, do you know what? I'm going to help you because it sounds, sounds hilariously fun. So basically, it's been an amazing journey. And I've been working with Han on and off for that, that same amount of, amount of time. And what he's achieved in, in, in London, especially the community in, 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 in that London. And his goal was to make a pair of jeans within the M25. And, and I, he reached that extremely, extremely, extremely quickly. But anyway, Han's going to tell his story now. So this is Han from Black Horse Lane. <laughs> Is that, yeah, okay. Hi, guys. Um, thank you. I'm glad to know you, by the way, Mohsin. You're an amazing person. So, um, I'm the founder of Black Horse Stain Ateliers, and we make uh, crafted jeans in London. We have three main... Uh, objectives. One is our community that we live in. The other one is the quality. And the third one is, is the transparency of what we do. But before I go into these three elements, I want to tell you a little bit about my own story. When I first started manufacturing in London uh, in 1994, um, I was 24. And I employed 110 people, and I was just beginning of my career. I was really hungry. I wanted to do a lot of money. I wanted to be successful. And for about 10 years, I manufactured in London about 5,000 garments a week, mainly tailoring. Throughout the years in UK, also in Europe, gradually production went offshore, and I follow that as well. And culturally, I'm from Turkey, so my first offshore factory was in Turkey. I employed 450 people in Istanbul, and within four years of that, High Street demanded that we should produce cheaper garments. So I went to China then. So in China, we were outsourcing our production, so it was year 2020, 2006, 2007. At the time, I had two daughters. One was nine, one was 12. So I was in this Chinese factory uh, in the dormitory where people slept on top of each other, and sometimes they make their own lunch or dinner in little stoves. And I was in this dormitory, and I was looking at this Chinese uh, worker who hasn't really seen, in China, 10 years ago, what uh, people used to do, they used to leave their villages for 11 months of the year, and they used to be paid pocket money, money per week or per month. And at the end of 11 months, when the Chinese New Year comes, they used to be paid all together, and they used to go back to their villages. So I was with this Chinese worker. He was, I think, making his lunch. I looked at him, and I was really feeling sorry for this Chinese guy because he hasn't seen his family for many, many months. But then, that moment, I realized, actually, between him and me, there was no difference. I haven't seen my family growing for so many years as well. So I had this disconnectivity with my family. Uh, my daughter was nine, and the other one was 12. And by those, about 10 years of their life, I was traveling regularly. So human psyche is an interesting one. When you are, uh, when th there is a split in your personality, it's a very painful process. So I was in pain. I was disconnected to my family. I didn't have a relationship with my family. And the city that I lived in, uh, it wasn't my city, really. So at that moment, when I was looking at that Chinese worker, I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to come out of fashion. I hate fashion, what fashion represents. And I decided to sell my interest, fashion, uh, the business interest to my partner. And I went back home. 
And I sat down with my family. I said, look, I am coming out of fashion. So they were surprised. They were happy. So we took one year off and went around Europe. Idea was for me, I wanted to reconnect with my family. So when we came back from European tour, I opened a fine dining restaurant in my neighborhood. Um, I lived in that neighborhood for 22 years at the time, but I didn't know any of my neighbors. And within one year of opening my restaurant, I started to get to know my neighbors in their first name, their children's name, their grandparents, grandfathers. So there was a huge uh, amount of connectivity, routining happening, uh, was happening for me. And I really enjoyed it. And just, op I mean, the restaurants are very democratic places. Everybody can go in and have coffee, tea, and it's open to everybody. But also, while I was running the restaurant, something else was happening in, in London. Um, the craft beer revolution, we call it. There were lots of smaller producers of beer in Hackney uh, producing these amazing, good quality beers. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And also, you were able to go to their, their places and, and see how the uh, beer is made. So that was great. But my personal journey wasn't finished yet. Also, I'm into humanistic psychotherapy, and the subject is very close to my heart. In one of those meetings, the subject was, how do you define yourself as an artist? How do you reconnect your, to your, with your own soul as an artist? We had about nine different people in the group. Uh, we had uh, brand agents, we had writers, uh, we had psychotherapists. Uh, lecturers, and, and I was there as well. So when the question came to me, I had this amazing, beautiful restaurant, successful restaurant, but I couldn't really define myself as an artist in my business. I said, look, I need to think about this. So the turn came back to me 45 minutes later. Through that time, I was trying to understand, so how, how do I express myself as an artist? Then I went through my life story, and I realized when I was in the factory making garments, I was the artist, I was connected to my creativity. And at that point, um, I decided I'm going to come out of um, restaurant business, and I'm going to come back to garment making, but in a very different way. So by having the restaurant, I understood that community is so important for one's soul, because if you are not, uh, if you don't feel that you belong to a community, you are a very lonely person. So that's why in, in Black Horse Lane Ateliers, our community is so important. So how do we achieve that? So what we do in, in the workshop, we have a pop-up restaurant. It's an op we have an open door policy. We have a pop-up restaurant. Everybody can come in. We, we do sourdough bread in Saturdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sunday mornings. We serve food in this space. So you could have an amazing romantic uh, dinner in a denim factory, as well as you could have brunch as well. So by opening our doors to the local community, people can see how our garments are made. So what happens with that when you build your community? First of all, you have to be transparent. Transparency, we've been talking about transparency a lot here. So transparency happens, and also when you build your community, accountability starts. I think that accountability is so important for each company. Because if you are connected, Alicia was talking about her own people, that's when accountability starts. Without accountability, I don't feel that uh, any company has uh, sustainability. Um, the other one is, with, Mo with Mosin, we do run master classes. What that means is we transfer our know-how to other people, and through that you, you create collaboration. I think in any community, collaboration is very important as well. And the other thing for us, uh, when we wanted to produce denim, 
We wanted to produce best denim in the world, best jeans in the world. And this is not a marketing slogan, this is more philosophical slogan, because we cannot compete with Turkish, Chinese, uh, Moroccan production, because London living wage is so important. In order to uh, be competitive, we couldn't be competitive with the prices, but we could have been competitive with the quality. And throughout our quality, we give lifetime repair guarantee to our jeans for two reasons. One, we want people to buy less. Throughout, when you buy less, that means you, you, uh, when you use something long enough, you buy less, and something else happens when you use something long enough. You, you build memories with your garments. I think every designer, I'm sure you guys are some of you designers, when you design something, you have to make sure that your customer has to build memories with your garments. When somebody builds memories with their garments, then they don't throw them away. So through that, we will have less throwaway culture. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, Han. So yeah, um, I'll open it up now. So Han owns a, a factory in East London. So you know, if you guys have got any questions about how he makes jeans or, or why does he think he's made his jeans so better, now's the time to ask him. Actually, what things do you do, Han, that you pride yourself on? That's a fair question I'll, I'll, I'll just ask. I'll open it up. Well, as I said, we try to make best jeans in the world. Uh, our construction methods are, methods are tailoring methods. What that means is when you open our, inside our jeans, you don't see any unfinished edges. Yeah. And there is a book which I think you recommended, History. Michael Allen Harris, yeah. Yes, what's the name of the book? Uh, Michael Allen Harris. I think it's American mm. History of Workwear, something like that. Yeah. So this guy, mad guy, went into mines and start digging some rotten garments. In one of those rotten garments, there is a one-piece fly. Yeah. And we do that one-piece fly in our construction. And what I realized when I was looking at this garment, there were no unfinished edges. The reason, and that was patented in 1877. So 140 years ago, all the jeans, all, all the garments were made by tailors. And they didn't have overlooking machines. So everything was the tailoring method. So what we do in Black Horse Lane, do you have this sentence, nobody makes these things like the olden days? Yeah. But we do. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Um, any questions at all for Han and Black Horse Lane? Yes, speak up really now. Uh, how many garments do you produce in a week or a month? It all depends on the projects, all the styles. If we have a, a designer who has a very complicated uh, design, the production goes 40% down, but also the quantities are important. There is no s uh, s standard numbers. Mm. In the big factories, standard numbers are important because the productivity is so Im important. For us, uh, our idea, our setup is we want to produce small quantities. So in a year, we produce about maybe five, 6,000 garments in a year. I used to produce five and a half thousand jackets a week in the same factory. We've been in this building for 25 years. So from five and a half thousand garments a week, now we produce 5,000 garments a year. That's the difference. But your building as well, you've changed it so there's artists living on site. You've made it a real community, right? So, so in our space, in our building, it's, it's a multidiscipline space where we have art, restor art restorers, uh, we have 28 different artists, sculptures, we have a pop-up restaurant, we have weavers, so it's, and also denim production. Yeah. So it's a through community space that way as well. Any more questions? <coughs> yes, sir. Speak up and st stand up, please, if you could. If you could. Are you wearing many of your own jeans? Yeah, this jeans is mine. Jacket is mine. <laughs> yes. Jeans, uh, I think it's about 22, 23 months. How and many times uh, have you washed it? Oh, hmm. I washed it. A very personal question. Yeah. <laughs> I am not a denim head, by the way, and I don't like it when people say they haven't washed their yeah, denim. You can say it. Okay. I'm the one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think wash your jeans, yeah. wash it responsibly, yeah. okay? Uh, I think maybe 10 times. Okay, yeah. good, good. Oh, oh thank you. Okay. Um, any
any more questions, guys, at all for hand? Okay. I'm going to get the mic. Where does your denim come from, the actual textile? So we work with three different countries. Uh, and when we look at the uh, actual denim fabric, we look at the quality. We look at uh, quality and the price relationship. That's for really important for us. And also the carbon footprint of that uh, fabric. We buy from Japan. Uh, we buy from Italy. And we buy from Turkey. Uh, Japanese, they produce one of the best uh, fabric in the world because they are a crafted nation, and when they look at anything they do, they do it in a crafted way. But unfortunately, Japan doesn't produce cotton. They buy their cotton in Africa, they buy it from uh, Texas, Australia, uh, Central Asia. Average uh, cotton travels to Japan, from Japan to England. Average carbon footprint of that fabric before we do anything is it has 20,000 kilometers on the clock. Uh, price, we, when we give one to 10 uh, point system, price is about uh, 10, let's say, and the quality to price, you pay 30% premium to the quality because they, they are crafted. Italians, I, I would say they are the second best. And this is an assumption from my side, but Italians mainly, they buy their uh, cotton from Egypt. Egypt to Italy is 500 kilometers. Italy to here, 1,800 kilometers. So 2,300 kilometers on the clock as a carbon footprint. Also Turks, they produce their own cotton as well. From Turkey to England is 2,500 kilometers. So we, we look at all those uh, um, reasons. And also, I think Handiano was saying that you should really visit the factories. And uh, we try to visit every single factory we buy. But also, some factories have huge reputation. Sometimes uh, you need to work with reputable uh, mills as well. Um, hi. So, um, obviously, advertising our jeans for life um, makes them sustainable in the long run, but that's also like a lot down to the consumer, like if they do choose to keep them for life. So, how would you say that you make them more sustainable in your production process as well? In our production process? Uh, well, we give lifetime repair guarantee. I think that's on its own, it's a statement. But also, what we realize over five years, uh, there are certain areas in the, in the genes, weak areas. One is in, around the crutch. It's always blow, 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 blow. And one is around the pocket. People, I don't know what they do, but this is a very weak area as well. So because we, we repair them for free, we want to produce the best quality, best uh, long-lasting genes. So we, for example, last eight months, we are supporting this area with another denim piece inside. So all these everyday little changes and, and, and paying uh, attention to the quality on its own is a very sustainable way of uh, producing garment. So making garments is much, 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 much better. S stronger, uh, yeah. Okay. Anyone else wants to have a question about Oh, coming back. Do you accept back your own garments to recycle or upcycle them? So like Absolutely, them? yes. Yes. Uh, I was, uh, you know, interesting thing is when somebody uses their garments long enough, they really build memories with them and they don't want to be part of it. We, we come across that a lot. And so far, we've been going on for five years and nobody has given back their garment yet. But I really believe in this emotional connectivity to your garments are one of the most sustainable way of living a life. Great. Anyway, um, I think that's it. Thank yeah. you so much, Han, Thank for your you. time. He's also um, someone who's extremely busy as well, so we appreciate him giving up his time.